Currents of frigid air played over Ludmilla's toes. She shivered and started to pull her feet back under the blankets, but she was blocked by an unyielding adversary. A soft murmur drifted into her ear, and the leg clamped over hers squeezed down. As per usual, Countess Clara Corlin had turned Baroness Ludmilla's Aradnik into her personal body pillow, except now Ludmilla decided that her childhood friend had firmly stepped onto a wayward path. With Corlin Castle still under construction, Clara had opted to remain in her old manor rather than moving into a temporary residence in the new harbour town. They were sleeping in her old bedroom, which Ludmilla had frequented many times throughout their long relationship. She could never get over how large it was. Not including all of the smaller rooms attached to it, Clara's bedroom was as large as the entire Zaradnik Manor in Warden's Vale. Not that Ludmilla's home was very large. Still, this fact always wore on her, House Zaradnik always had a reputation for humility, but even she understood that a manor should be more than a hole in a rocky hillside no larger than a noble daughter's bedroom. She narrowed her eyes, peering through the gossamer veils of Clara's luxurious four-poster bed. Arranged in a line on the floor across the room was the source of the cold air. Her friend had six of the magical cooling boxes from the Empire custom made to be opened on both ends. She then purchased six magical fans and left one running inside of each. The result was that, despite the sweltering heat of the lowland summer, the air in Clara's bedroom remained cold. Not cool, but cold. Nearly as cold as winter in Warden's Vale. The sole reason, of course, was so that Clara could latch onto Ludmilla to her heart's content while they slept. Clara's arms and legs were securely draped over her, and she occasionally pressed her body against hers as if she could somehow snuggle even closer than she already had. Because Clara was at home, none of her household came to rouse her, and so they dozed the morning away until Ludmilla felt that it must already be noon. Decadence. Decadence and wickedness. Oblivious to Ludmilla's thoughts, Clara snuggled against her again, nuzzling her shoulder. A contented smile was painted lightly over her face. Over her belly, Ludmilla could feel the metal band on one of the fingers of Clara's hand, like herself, she now also had a ring of sustenance. Clara had learned about the item from Ludmilla shortly after Ludmilla received it from Lord Mayor. A few days later, Clara had one too. She declared with firm conviction that, since they now only needed to sleep once a week, they should do so together. Ludmilla wasn't sure how that made any sense at all, but she did think it would be nice to spend time together on a regular basis. And, so, Countess Corlin had secured her preferred article of bedding. She didn't like it when their scheduled time together was disrupted, either. When the Goblin Army had invaded the Upper Reaches, she told Ludmilla to slaughter the stupid Demis as quickly as possible so they could go back to sleeping together. She wondered how the hundred thousand odd dead demi-humans would feel if they knew their demise was expedited by one person wanting to sleep together with her best friend and another wanting a bottle of the enemy commander's blood. Even as a follower of the six great gods, she felt just a bit sorry for them. I wonder how people would feel if they saw the radiant jewel of the Riverlands lazing about like this, Ludmilla muttered. Various fantasies would enter their imaginations, I think, Clara replied through lidded eyes. Too bad for them that I will never leave any space between us. Ludmilla sighed at the self-indulgent reply. It was not something anyone else would ever hear or believe in the slightest. To the people of Calling County, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Clara rose above even her lofty moniker. She selflessly toiled away to develop her territory, never allowing her wealth and power to get to her head. Yet, at the same time, she wielded that wealth and power with unquestionable mastery. Every other noble in the Sorceress Kingdom could only look on in envy or exasperation as she continually pulled further ahead. She didn't compete with anyone, and no one could compete against her anyways, she existed in her own realm, pursuing ambitions that only she could consider. They weren't the ambitions one might expect out of a wealthy and powerful noble, either. Clara treated her domain as her personal garden, trying to make every millimeter of it into the future paradise that only she could see. She wanted everything to grow and blossom and thrive, bearing fruit impossible to cultivate for anyone else. Any political or economic motions that she championed were also focused towards this goal of seemingly infinite refinement. The administration held her productivity up as a model for the other nobles to follow. The people considered her a saint. Ludmilla was fairly certain that the temples would actually declare her one sooner or later. As people so often said, she was an angel made flesh and, with every passing week, this seemed more and more an indisputable truth. 
I should make my way home soon, Ludmilla said. Moo. The lizardman chief often makes that sound. At least he sees you more frequently than I do. Ludmilla wriggled her way free, fishing up her small clothes from the floor beside the bed. Clara just rolled straight off of the bed, silken sheets and all, hitting the stone floor with a light grunt before she lazily pulled her own things on without getting up. The exemplar of noble grace and elegance, indeed. Lunch? Clara's question rolled out from under the bed. I have over two weeks of work to catch up on, Ludmilla answered. I hardly even know where to start now. Lord Mayor is just about done with his landscaping, is he not? Somehow, in addition to her huge domain, Clara somehow also kept track of Warden's Veil. Vale. It always felt like she could handle much more than that, as well. Just about, Ludmilla replied. I have to figure out the weather once Lord Mayor is done diverting that river, Blay. What? He is raising the southern end soon, Ludmilla frowned. After that, everything really starts. I think you have a solid plan, Clara said. You always say that I have a solid plan. Because you always do? Sometimes I envy how you are not tempted to fly off on hopelessly convoluted schemes like me. Are you really running all the way back in armor? Ludmilla checked over her equipment. The hole left by the Nolara was already fixed. It was literally two small plates of her brigandine that Kovalev replaced in less than an hour. Two months ago, she would have felt encumbered by the weight of everything. Now, it felt no more a burden than a summer dress. Yes, Ludmilla nodded. The way there is still basically wildland, after all. You never know if you will run into some hungry or aggressive beast. Then just take the boat if it is not safe. It is safe enough, and the boat is headed upriver already. Besides, I am at least three times faster than the boat. Though she had fallen behind the platinum rank rangers of the Adventurer Guild, she still possessed substantial speed and endurance when it came to long-distance movement. There was no need for a horse or a wagon. In fact, a horse was slower, extremely so when navigating the rugged highlands. The time required to travel from place to place grew shorter as she grew stronger, freeing up time for her to get more done. She could move from village to village in a matter of minutes, and the run from Clara's manor to her own in Warden's Vale took roughly half a day. It made her wonder what a ranger like Lady Aura was capable of. After bidding her farewells to Clara, Ludmilla headed not west, but east on a whim, entering the still under construction Callin Harbour. She crossed the Katza River over the newly constructed bridge, then made her way west again through the burgeoning vineyards along the river valley. Two hours later, she was scaling her way up the eastern barrier range. It wasn't long until she spotted one of the Kronos above, who she called down to get a fly spell from. She ran southeast across the high mountain meadows, then secured another fly spell to drop down to Warden's Vale. She landed on the flats before the village, where several of her subjects scorped at her airborne rival. Looking to the west, she decided the new route had saved her roughly four hours. It was not only her physical growth that had changed the way that she saw the world, but also the experiences beyond the mundane life that she had once lived. On the way up to her manor, she found Leluvian and Willuvian eating dinner in front of their home with their mother. Ludmilla held up a hand as the two pregnant women started to rise from their seats. I took a shortcut, she said, so I know that I am unexpectedly early. The sisters exchanged glances, and Leluvian offered her a puzzled look. A shortcut, my lady. I went over the mountains this time, Ludmilla said. I will be catching up on work, was there anything urgent that required my attention? Yes, my lady. I'm uncertain if you knew of this beforehand, but Lady Shizu arrived at the harbour two hours ago. She's waiting inside the manor for you right now. Ludmilla turned around and rushed off. She hadn't received any notification of the sort. She entered the hall to find the pink-haired woman being entertained by the three vampire brides. They looked up from their discussion around the dining table, where they appeared to be having tea. My apologies, Lady Shizu, Ludmilla lowered her head, I was not aware that you were coming to visit. It's okay. Was it? No, it was almost certainly not okay to have a servant of the sorcerer king wait around for two hours. To what do I owe the pleasure of your company, my lady? She asked. Shizu is fine. I beg your pardon? Shizu is fine. Understood, Miss Shizu. Shizu is fine. I apologize, Miss Shizu, Ludmilla lowered her head again, 
but out of respect for your position as a member of His Majesty's household, I must at least address you as such. Lady Shizu's scarf shifted as she tilted her head slightly, eyeing her with her expressionless look. Okay, she said after several moments of silence. They stared at one another. What was it that they were supposed to be talking about again? Lady Shizu rose from her seat. Bo, she held out a gloved hand. Bo? Ah, yes, Ludmilla retrieved the weapon from her infinite haversack. The rune Bo Ultua. Ultua? Oh. Mm, yes. Ludmilla went to one knee, holding out the rune bow in both hands as she faced the floor. Please let His Majesty know how grateful I am for his consideration, she said solemnly. Without the rune bow Ultua, I would have been powerless against the fiend that arrived from the west. She stayed where she was until she felt the bow being lifted from her hands. Got it. Ludmilla rose to her feet as Lady Shizu walked past her, making her way through the hall towards the door. Ludmilla and the vampire brides followed her, and one of them went ahead to open the way. They escorted her towards the village entrance and, on the way down the lane, Ludmilla cleared her throat. Miss Shizu, she said, where might one purchase weapons forged with runecraft? There was a long silence between them, and Ludmilla wondered if she had asked something inappropriate. Not in stores yet, Lady Shizu finally said. Maybe soon? Then, is there some way to order them in advance? Ludmilla asked, this wonderful equipment will surely be in great demand. If I may ask, how much would something like the rune bow Elchwa cost? Lady Shizu looked down at the bow. This bow, she said, I don't know. Expensive? Even a rough estimate would be. Expensive. I I see. Mmm. Work hard. Ludmilla dipped into a respectful curtsy as Lady Shizu turned around and went on her way. Maybe the influx of magic items from the recent conflict had caused her to become greedy. She hadn't even considered that she wouldn't be able to afford items produced with runecraft. A weapon like Rune Bow Ultua was probably at the level of a national treasure, how could a minor noble like herself think of purchasing something of that caliber? Never mind that, her meager archery skills were not even remotely worthy of such an excellent bow. She turned around to find the three vampire brides standing in a row behind her. Lady Shizu wasn't the only person she had kept waiting. With a deep breath, she scraped together her thoughts. Now that the matter to the south is resolved, Ludmilla said, we can start looking at how the postal service will be set up in Warden's Vale. I believe I'm aware of the basic requirements for a service branch, but were there any specific needs for what we built here? Lady Shiltir desires this territory to be a testbed for concepts related to the transportation network, the one in the center told her. Rather than a regular post office branch, one suitable for this location, complete with a development office and a bank, will need to be established. Ludmilla's slow nodding stopped at the mention of a bank. What does a bank have to do with the transportation network? Ludmilla asked. It is a proposal put forward by Lady Gonye, the vampire bride answered. Aside from the merchant guild branches in Irantal and the towns of various counties, the denizens of the Sorceress Kingdom do not have access to anything resembling banking services. This includes rural human populations, as well. The Postal Service is perfectly positioned to provide banking to all citizens of the Sorceress Kingdom, especially those in remote and inaccessible locations. So something like what the Merchant Guild offers to its members? Accounts and such? I believe so. The vampire bride replied. In our case, however, the focus will be on the citizenry rather than businesses. What sort of services will this bank offer? Establishing a system that facilitates the circulation of coinage in a similar manner to the merchant guild is our first goal, the vampire bride told her. Educating the population and developing trust in the system may be a significant hurdle to its use for many species. Many species? Yes. Lady Gonye initially conceived of the idea while working in the Great Forest of Top. The local demi-human and heteromorph populations have access to vast quantities of untapped resources in their remote territories. Now that the means are available to conduct trade with the places where these resources are in demand, the Postal Bank will facilitate transactions, secure citizen savings, and act as a means to unify the economy of the Sorcerer's Kingdom. I see. Ludmilla thought she understood what was being proposed. The idea wouldn't have warranted consideration in Rias ties, as the vast majority of its citizens did not have much in the way of savings, but the subjects of the Sorceress Kingdom were set on the cusp of unheard of prosperity. 
The recent harvest had placed what would be previously considered vast wealth in the hands of her tenants, and the administration of Warden's Vale was currently keeping track of it in a manner inspired by the operations of the Merchant Guild. The other territories in the Sorceress Kingdom did not have the luxury of optimizing their industry from the ground up as she had, but they would still gradually experience the same transition in their respective industries. They would probably need something similar to handle their newfound wealth unless everyone started building vaults in their homes. If the postal bank was allowed to fill this role, her people would gain access to a financial network that spanned the entire Sorceress Kingdom. It would enable them to access their wealth from anywhere a postal branch could be found, or even make purchases over long distances without needing to leave the domain. One could order goods from Erantel through a catalog, presumably something better than the crude list that she had drawn up for her magic item production, and send their payments through the postal bank. For that matter, one could order magic items produced in Warden's Vale from anywhere in the Sorceress Kingdom with this innovation. In her mind, the benefits of the system were nothing short of astonishing. If Florine had come up with the idea, Ludmilla doubted that someone like herself could point out any flaws with the proposal. I assume a comprehensive proposal for this postal bank has been forwarded. We've brought a copy with us, along with everything else that Lady Shiltier once looked into. Excellent, Ludmilla smiled. We should head back in and take a look. It would be an understatement to say she was excited by the potential of the postal bank. As the ruler of the remote and isolated border territory, the concept struck a chord in her heart that she hadn't known had existed up until this very point. Her motivation to advance the development of her domain and its industries was galvanized even further than before. Ludmilla? She raised a hand to her rear as they walked along. Yes, Lady Shultier. Will you be back at home soon? I found a bit of a shortcut, so I have already arrived. Oh good, I'll be dropping by in a bit. I'm sending that one I mentioned over tonight, but she's difficult to locate sometimes with all of her wandering about. Albedo has us all trapped in a royal court session right now, but I should be there before she arrives. Barring some emergency, I will be reviewing things with the vampire brides in the manor tonight. Should I have anything prepared for your arrival, my lady? No, it's fine. I'll just be there to introduce you to her and outline my expectations, then I have to go do some things up north. Anyways, Albedo is starting to send dirty looks in my direction, so I'll see you later this evening. The message spell cut off, and Ludmilla lowered her hand. Her gaze went out to the dried-out floodplain, where Chief Denises was working with his people to raise their new dwellings. As with the Lizardman chief, Ludmilla was supposed to become a mentor to a promising candidate for whatever Lady Shultier had in mind for them, but she had no clue who or what this person was. Things were due to become very busy soon, so she wasn't even sure how much time she could put into training her. Since this mentorship was something that would presumably last for an extended period of time, she hoped that they would at least be able to get along. Hey ho, look, turtles. Fuck off, Henrich. A dozen of Elysian iron turtles raised their heads at the shout, staring over in the party's direction. Fortunately, unlike the adventurer training area, the vast majority of wild animals did not arbitrarily attack strange passers-by without substantial provocation. The adventurers hushed and walked away, and the turtles returned to wading in their pristine forest pool. Themis let out a sigh of relief. Without a ranger in their party, she already had problems aplenty to apply her mana to. People were poisoned by thorns and various other plants, stung by insects, injured themselves in rough terrain and, for whatever god's forsaken reason, kept sticking things into their mouths. They certainly did not need to get into a fight with every animal they encountered as they explored the foothills of the Azalizia Mountains. You people need to knock that off soon, a voice sounded from above. I know this whole thing's kinda been like an afternoon stroll so far, but we're just about at the edge of the Sorceress Kingdom now. She looked up. Standing on a branch in the canopy was Merry. The elf ranger frowned out into the gloom, seemingly sparing them none of her attention. Themis wondered how she could move around so quickly. She supposedly checked on every team out in the field, and the expedition was combing over a ten-kilometer wide strip in their survey for the new northern highway that would connect the Sorceress Kingdom to the Dwarf Kingdom in the central Azalizia Mountains. Mary's comment about an afternoon stroll was not too far off the mark. They had started at the Lizardman village at the southern tip of the Great Lake, skirted around its shores to the northern side, then set off along the foothills of the Azalizia Mountains through the northern reaches of the Great Forest of Top. 
all of it belonged to the Sorceress Kingdom, which was to say that all the tribes had been subjugated, as well as any intelligent monsters. Dangerous beasts and monsters with low intelligence had been culled, though the threshold for dangerous was still fairly high by the standards of the lowlands. They occasionally encountered top bears, saber wolves, and top tigers, as well as many weaker predators, all of which mostly avoided them. In essence, it was purely survey work with the greatest risk stemming from hungry wild animals. Mary, Themis asked, how far to the edge are we? Doesn't matter how far to the edge we are, Mary answered. All that matters is that we're at the edge. Nothing out here has ever seen your pretty little human maps, and there sure as hell isn't a giant line drawn on the ground where your maps show him. Monsters and tribes have their own views about territory, and most of them don't see things the same way as humans do. And what about elves? Themis wanted to ask, but she kept it to herself. Elves were seen by most as human enough, but they definitely had ways of their own. Then there was the ongoing conflict between the slain theocracy and the elven kingdom in Evansa. Themis couldn't help but think that Mary might bear some hostility to those who worship the Six, so she wanted to avoid any accidental friction between them. Strangely enough, Aura and Mare's behavior towards her suggested nothing of the sort. As evening approached, they turned and headed off towards the new location of their base camp. It was raised above a dark, boggy valley where a large population of Myconids dwelled. Themis eyed her party members suspiciously. You're not hiding any mushrooms or anything you found out here, are you? She asked. Ma Abi. What are you thinking? We're camping out by a bunch of mushroom people and you went and picked some mushrooms to eat? Wait, are they even safe to eat? I'm not some sort of convenient cure poison wand, you know. Themis fumed silently as half of her team dumped out their bags. Why was it that she had to look out for this kind of thing? More to the point, the fact that she was a priestess of the Six had people constantly accusing her of discriminating against non-humans, which in turn made her constantly cross-examine herself to make sure she wasn't accidentally offending anyone. The others were utterly lacking in the same sense of self-awareness, assuming that everyone and everything framed the world in the same manner as themselves. They arrived as evening fell, finding the structure of the base camp organized as close to standard as possible. Themis directed her team to deliver their samples to be sorted out for transport to Erantel, while she went to deliver their report. Henrich was generally an excellent party leader out in the field, but he was decidedly terrible at paperwork. As the other platinum-ranked adventurer on their team, she had somehow become his second and handled their tasks in the base. Mocknich, Themis said as she entered the central pavilion, I've... Something tickled her nose, and she sneezed. Covering her mouth, she looked back up and found Mocknich and Blair within, as well as a four-meter-tall mushroom with limbs. The inside of the pavilion lacked any lighting, which was fine since she possessed an earring that conferred dark vision, but the air shimmered with a glowing cloud of, something. She looked between the two mithril-ranked adventurers, assessing their condition. No need for alarm, Blair raised a hand. They are the Sovereign's spores. S. Sovereign? The leader of a Myconid colony is called a Sovereign. Blair explained. The members of the colony usually communicate through spores, like the ones that you see in the air right now. They're not harmful, they facilitate a sort of telepathy. I see, um, I've just come to deliver my team's reports. I'll leave them on the table here. She leaned over and placed the folder with the day's summary on the table nearby, then ducked out of the pavilion. A dozen strides away, she released her breath and inhaled the cool evening air. T there was a perfectly good reason for that. It's not that I hate them, but they're heteromorphs that think in entirely alien ways. Humans can never fully understand them, or know what they'll do. As a cleric, it's my responsibility to stay clear of any contamination so I can react appropriately in case something happens. Her behavior was perfectly rational. There was no reason to feel like she was the one in the wrong somehow. For that matter, why had Blair gone and exposed himself? He was the highest level divine caster present in the expedition. Then again, he was a druid, the experience might have just been an exhilarating prospect for him. Themis sighed, then cast Cure Poison and Lesser Restoration on herself, just in case. She made her way to the base relay point, where the carefully organized samples were awaiting transport. Hey Pen, she said, holding out another folder, here's the survey data for today. Thanks. Your samples are um. The sorcerer's hand pointed loosely at a set of preservation enchanted containers, 
Over there? They should be labeled. Themis made her way over and started checking through their work. How was your end of things today? She asked. I was in the base today, Pen answered. Well, I was moving the base today. That's probably why I was assigned. I would have never thought that my first adventure would consist of me using floating board as my main spell. Not even any time to study, huh? Uck, don't remind me. I'm still trying to figure out fly. Themis smiled in sympathy. While one might believe that their rapid growth was a great thing, spells still took time to learn. None of the newer members of the Adventurer Guild had anywhere near the repertoire of spells that someone who had decades of study under their belts possessed. A caster without the appropriate spells was a detriment, and figuring out what to learn had become a matter of careful planning and calculation. I bet the others don't have to worry about anything like that, Themis said. You bet, Pen snorted. All they do when they get back is swap stories about their adventures. What adventures? The most we ever do is chase away a hungry bear. I think they've been competing over how much trouble they manage to get themselves in. If that's the reason why they keep wasting my mana, Themis frowned. I'm going to kill them and reanimate their corpses to carry my things. If you do, Pen muttered, returning to her work. Let me borrow them the next time I get assigned to base duty. Freed of her team responsibilities, Themis made her way to another part of the base camp, where most of the adventurers were gathered. A few, namely the casters, had retired to their respective tents to study and rest. Rather than the boisterous atmosphere of evenings past, however, things were rather subdued. Mary stood near the bonfire, and nearly everyone was listening attentively to her. How do we even fight that? A voice rose from the crowd, the way you describe it, it's impossible. It is impossible, Mary told him. I ain't gonna try and talk you guys up about it. We survive by not fighting. We're staying down in the foothills until the final stretch anyways, so chances are we won't see him at all, but it's not a guarantee. I'm probably gonna be eating my own words by saying this, but, if we run into a scouting party, then maybe, maybe we can come out on top if it comes down to a fight. If it's a raiding party, we run the hell away and hope they haven't noticed us. What's she talking about? Themis whispered over Howe's shoulder. Frost giants, he said in a low voice. Some idiot saying we should go out and try finding some of them on the way to Fiorizo. Can a whole race be that strong, though? Another voice turned their attention back to the discussion. I know that there's plenty of Demis that are stronger than humans, but this is a whole other thing. I've never heard of anything like that down around E. Rantle. Well, yeah, Mary replied. That's why you live there. Humans are too weak to live anywhere else, not without being in a nation that has citizens of other races to make up for the difference. Expect any frost giants you run into to be difficulty rating 60 minimum. That's me trial rank if you didn't realize till now. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a few up there above 120. A low murmur rose. Difficulty rating 120, it was beyond adamantite, beyond the realm of heroes. How could they survive running into something like that? The simple answer was that they couldn't. As Mary had mentioned, all they could do was avoid a confrontation, or run if it came down to it. I don't know why you're all acting so shocked, Mary said. You knew where we were headed, and I'm sure everyone's heard that frost giants fight frost dragons like it's their favorite pastime. I'm not trying to scare you here, well. Maybe I am, but I'm mainly underscoring the fact that the purpose of this expedition is to get the survey for this highway done. After that, we'll see about the stuff listed in our secondary objectives. The following morning, Themis emerged from her tent feeling more refreshed than she had been in quite some time. Most of the others, however, appeared less than enthusiastic. The difference probably stemmed from the fact that Mary's words reflected what Themis had known for nearly all of her life. While the six great gods favored humanity, the teachings of their faith laid out the truth quite plainly. Humanity was weak, and its enemies were powerful and plentiful. It was through discipline, hard work, and cultivation of strength through many generations that they would realize the promise of a better future in a world filled with dire threats. Though they were not a branch of the temple, the Adventurer Guild was an organization where humans were exposed to the truth of the world that they lived in. This made it an opportunity to show that the tenets of her faith reflected these truths and the approach that humanity should take to face the realities of their world. Too long had the people of the Northern Kingdoms grown indolent, even going so far as to twist and corrupt the faith itself. 
Themis thought the time was ripe to reverse the damage and bring the humans of the Sorceress Kingdom back into the fold. Only a cleric of Sursana could look so happy when we're all marching off to our graves. Themis glanced to the side and found that Mag had fallen in beside her as they lined up for breakfast. The petite rogue sported a haggard appearance, as if she hadn't slept all night. Mary said we're purposely trying to avoid them, Themis said, but if we run into any, you've died in training before, haven't you? Well, yeah, Mag answered sourly, but that doesn't mean I want to die again. As long as you learn and grow stronger from it, Themis said. With the Adventurer Guild, you have the unique opportunity to fully explore your potential. That sounds sketchy as hell, Mag told her. If Winna said that to me back before I signed up, I would have turned right around and run away. Then how would you have said it? Themis frowned. I I don't know, Mag said, I know some rogues are really good at scamming people, but that ain't me. Hire a bard or something. I wasn't trying to scam you. It was supposed to be encouragement. Themis sighed. One of the faithful would have understood her words of support. It was difficult to connect with others. Overt proselytizing was immediately rejected as well. It was often said that people would see your faith shine through the way you lived your life, but adventurers tended to live a life that they felt others should envy or aspire to. By mid-morning, the adventurer teams have crossed into the upper foothills beyond the official border of the Sorceress Kingdom. The landscape was dominated by cool, evergreen forests and the glacial peaks of the nearby Azalizia Range. The final stretch Mary referred to was not too far off, a thirty-odd kilometer run of rocky moors and alpine meadows leading up to the entrance of Fiorizo, the southernmost city of the Dwarf Kingdom. She shivered, wondering if cold protection spells would be needed soon. The skies were clear but it felt like the sun was losing its strength in this place rimmed with peaks of ice and snow. They were trying to figure out a way over a narrow box canyon when a shrill, whistling sound filtered through the air. The party froze. That's a, run, right? Henrich asked. Yup, Themis answered. Running. They scurried back the way they came. After reaching a thicker portion of the forest, they gathered behind a short escarpment. How far away was that? It was pretty loud, Mag said, probably within a few kilometers. The noise came again, much louder than before. It was a signal arrow, which was agreed on beforehand to warn of deadly threats to the entire expedition. Oi, oi, are they bringing them to us? Henrich pulled his warhammer from his belt. We did all come from the same direction, Mag poked her head over the edge. We shouldn't run all the way back to camp with whatever it is, should we? Themis asked. Whatever we do, Henrich said, we can't stay put. Keep going. They scrambled off again, making their way down the mud-slicked rocks as quickly as they could. A shadow passed over them, and a hiss briefly filled the air. Behind them, far closer than they would have liked, a low-pitched snarl came from somewhere in the forest. Hey, you. Mary's voice called down, stop and help get rid of this one. See can we do it? Yeah, no problem. Just get ready to keep running when we're done. Themis and Penn came forward, raising their hands towards Henrich. Blessing. Lesser dexterity. Protection from evil. Lesser strength. Shield of faith. Haste. Whoa, Henrich shouted, how dead am I here? Themis and Penn wordlessly ducked into the trees behind him. Ability boost. Henrich activated a boost art and then a rustling sound in the branches caused him to crane his neck upwards. A towering form emerged from behind a nearby tree. Themis stared up at her, when did such a huge thing get so close? Clad in layered hides, muscles rippling under her ice-blue skin, the seven-meter-tall frost giant brought her battle-axe down on Henrich. Henrich raised his shield. Fortress. A resounding crack rose into the sky and a cloud of dried needles and leaves exploded into the air from the force of the blow. When it finally settled down, Themis saw that Henrich had been driven down to one knee. What the fuck? Henrich whimpered in a hoarse voice. The frost giant pulled back her axe for another strike. At the apex of her swing, a narrow whistled in and the giant's wrist erupted into flame. She let out a startled cry but did not release her weapon, instead clapping her wrist with her other hand to extinguish the fire. Two more arrows sailed in, finding her left shoulder. Good job, Mary said, no problem, right? I'll be right back Tilda. 
The giant stepped off towards the sound of Mary's voice. Henrich dashed off after her, driving his warhammer into the giant's ankle. The head of the weapon bounced harmlessly off of the layers of hides wrapped around her boots. A crossbow bolt pinged off of her iron helmet. Scorching ray. A line of flame streaked out from the trees, connecting with the giant's waist. The giant turned and pulled a hatchet from her belt, whipping it towards the source of the spell. Pen let out a surprised noise before sliding against the tree behind her to the ground. Her right arm was severed at the shoulder, pinned to the tree by a piece of her robe. Themis bolted forward, working to reattach the sorceress lost limb. The rest of the party was trying to get in close to the frost giant, but the reach of her weapon was keeping them at bay. Henrich raised his shield and moved forward, ducking under the sweeping axe blade. Challenging shout. The frost giant turned her full attention to Henrich, who focused on defending himself while the rest of the party closed in. The wavering strain of a disjointed medley drifted over the air, and Themis stopped tending to Pennsylvania the spell song of healing would help the entire party slowly recover, so she could leave the sorceress now that her critical injuries were dealt with. Henrich ducked under the giant's battle axe, sending the briefest of glances in Lawrence's direction. Themis agreed with the fighter, the spell song could be useful in an extended fight, but they couldn't afford an extended fight with more frost giants on the way. She went through a mental inventory of the bard's spell songs, then realized that he didn't have anything that could help them end the fight quickly. Like magic casters, bards needed time to learn how to perform spell songs, so Lawrence was similarly lacking in his repertoire. Another crossbow bolt came in, bouncing off of the frost giant's shoulder. Mag cursed. A rock bounced off of her waist. The difficulties that came with fighting giant opponents were painfully clear. The sixth member of their party was Morris, a monk, who was having difficulty getting in close to deal any damage to the giant as she moved about attacking Henrich. She wasn't sure if it would matter if he could, they all stood below the giant's knee, and her lower legs were covered in the boots and wrapped in the hides that Henrich had failed to deal any damage through before. The giant's axe came in again, and Henrich deflected the blow towards the ground with his shield. He moved inside the frost giant's step as he did and cocked his warhammer. Smash. The weapon arced upward, crunching into the side of the giant's knee. Her leg buckled, and Morris sped forward to drive his fist into her exposed thigh. The frost giant roared and swatted the monk away with a fierce backhand. Morris flew off into some bushes over a dozen meters away. Themis jogged around the frost giant, beyond the reach of her battle axe. She decided right then and there that she hated fighting giants, they scattered her party out of healing range in every direction. Challenging shout. Henrich drew their opponent's attention again, and Mag dashed forward. Yahoo! Out of the corner of her eye, Themis saw the rogue leap up to grab a hold of the giant's belt, pulling herself onto her bent back. A stiletto appeared in her hand. Blood was soaking the frost giant's hides by the time she managed to shake Mag off. She landed and went into a roll, deftly rising to her feet at the end. It landed, probably. Mag peered at the bleeding giant. What did? Giant wasp venom, the rogue replied. I stabbed her like ten times, so something must have stuck. Themis looked up from where she was healing Morris. Whether the frost giant had been affected by the coordination hampering venom, she could not tell, but being stabbed in the back by a rogue ten times was the more likely culprit for her wavering form. Morris rose from where he was kneeling with a nod and headed back into the fray. Despite being weakened to such a great extent, the frost giant doggedly fought on. Even a glancing blow dealt tremendous damage, but the advantage that they had gained was clear. The party found its rhythm and, as the frost giant finally fell to the ground, Mary appeared once again in the trees overhead. Oh, looks like you guys pulled through. Her gaze passed over each of their members, then stopped at Penn, who was still shivering under the same tree she had ended up under. What happened to Penn? Mary asked, dampening their relation. She got her attention before I did. Henrich's voice was sharp. Just as you left, where did you go? I was killing the other frost giant right behind it. The party turned their gaze northwards, but nothing but sunlight and shadows could be seen through the trees. If not for the big blue corpse in front of them, no one would have believed that one had been stalking through the forest. How did we not notice this huge thing coming right at us? Pen asked. Because this one's a ranger? Mary said, pretty decent, too. Young and stupid, though. 
Instead of reporting back to her party, she and her buddy chased after me. If something this huge and powerful can hide so well, Max said sourly, what's the point in being small, I wonder. No one said the world's a fair place, Mary shrugged. Those frost dragons around the city are sneaky as hell, too. But you saw these frost giants coming, Themis said. I thought we weren't supposed to have anything to do with them until we were done with the survey. The whole bunch was about to cross our path, Mary told her. Still are, actually. We've wasted enough time standing around. A horn blared in the distance, joined by several others. The howl of wolves joined in an unsettling chorus. Themis could swear that the branches above were shuddering with the force of distant footsteps. Mary motioned for the party to pick themselves up. At least I don't have to use signal arrows anymore, she said. Let's go, we need to get everyone out of here. At the polished wooden counter of the Adventurer Guild's main plaza office, Ishpan and Winner stood across from a slightly cringing figure. Winner smiled silently, while Ishpan had her arms folded before her. The brown-haired receptionist might have sported a neutral expression, but it felt as if her olive eyes were simmering like pools of virulent venom. Hmm, well, what can I say? And maybe we should start with something less extreme. Do you have something easier? That was a copper rank run. We don't have anything easier. Ilishnish flinched. Ishpan's voice was not exactly a shout, but in the all too quiet atmosphere of the plaza office, it certainly felt like one. The sound was loud enough to allow her blind sight to map out the details of the entire building as the receptionist's voice sent slight vibrations throughout its structure. Ilishnish wrung her hands nervously in the stillness that followed. Acting cute won't help you here, Ishpan growled. I'm not acting. Ilishnish replied defensively, besides, that run was absolutely unreasonable. How was it unreasonable? You were the only person in the party that didn't make it. They didn't know. That, or there was something obviously very wrong with their heads. How could anyone stand those? Those, all dark and shiny and making that terrible rustling noise. And the smell. Ilishnish shuddered at the memory, I could feel them the moment I walked in, you know. Crawling around behind the walls. Just how in the world did you manage to collect millions of those things? They're just bugs, Ishpan countered. How can you be an adventurer if you're scared of bugs? Didn't Mary say you were in the realm of heroes? They're not just bugs, Ilishnish told her, they're dirty. Imagine if they got under your scare, under your skirts. What if you get some weird rash? A strange, incurable disease that makes you itch in some unspeakable place until your flesh sloughs away, no amount of hero will help you then. To the side, Winner's smile vanished, and she drew the hem of her dress in more closely. At least she had some common sense. Ishpan's eyebrow twitched, but she was not dissuaded. The fact of the matter is that you're the first person ever to fail our opening copper rank assessment, Ishpan said, and the rules are the rules. You'll be subjected to a cooling off period. Cooling off? Ilishnish frowned. Frost dragons were immune to cold. Did that mean she would be subjected to this cooling off period forever? You won't be able to try again for a time, Ishpan explained. This is to prevent people from thoughtlessly attempting the assessment over and over again. Please reflect upon your experience here so that you will not fail a second time. So, I don't get a copper plate? Of course not. I am an adventurer, right? Not officially. You're a provisional adventurer, at best. Ilishnish's shoulders shrunk and her lip quivered. What was she going to do? Would they tell Lady Shultier? She really didn't want to find out what would happen. If you'd like to help out around the city, Winu offered, we have some things to deliver to the post office. Delivery? Ilishnish perked up, I, I can do that, I think. She was directed to the Adventurer Guild headquarters in the Central District, where she was to see Guildmaster Iant Sack about the parcels. The shimmer of midsummer heat could be seen rising off of the cobblestones as she made her way through the city, and she wondered why humans would choose such a dismal place to dwell. When she arrived at her destination, she found the guildmaster not inside, but outside watching a group of humans gathered in some sort of newly dug pit. They were sweating and screaming and beating each other with pieces of wood. Was it some form of mutual torture? Whatever it was, they all looked rather vicious. Perhaps it was part of some bloody ritual that helped to raise such frightful beings. Guildmaster Ryan Sack was similarly sweating, occasionally barking something down at the people below. 
She did her best to keep her face straight as a gust of wind washed the odor of many ripe humans over her. Most of the time, frost dragons did not have a scent, or rather their scent matched their native environments. It was the scent of crisp air that one might breathe in when they frequented icy climes, frozen seas, or cold boreal forests. This was one of the aspects of her kind that made them such excellent hunters in their own homes. The only way one could detect a frost dragon by scent was if a normal scent was not supposed to be present. Oh, shiver, the guildmaster rose and turned towards her. What brings you here? Winna sent me to deliver some parcels to the post office, Ilishnish replied. She made it sound like they needed to go out immediately. That last part was a lie, but she didn't want to linger and risk having the guildmaster confront her over her recent failure. He disappeared into the office, appearing several minutes later with a crate. Within were six infinite haversacks. She caught herself leaning forward, enticed by the scent of the valuable items. I didn't know that there was any rush, the guildmaster handed over the crate, or I'd have gone and sent them myself. Well, better you than Ishpan coming out and yelling at me over it. Thanks, Shiver. She bobbed her head silently before scurrying off, making her way out to the northern gate of the district. Following the road and turning into the demi-human quarter, she walked towards the newly constructed post office. The large stone building was situated in the corner just inside the gate, opposite the Azure Sky, Iron Fist Institute for Promising Children. A sign hung over the entrance of the post office, portraying a white envelope with small black bat wings spread to either side. The envelope was sealed with a red heart. Lady Shiltier was quite proud of the sign and had gone to great lengths to explain its romantic symbolism to her. After a week or so, Ilishnish still didn't get it. Within, there was a short line of various species, mostly demi-humans with a single dwarf, and she took her place at the end of the queue. When it was her turn at the counter, a familiar individual greeted her. Good afternoon, the vampire bride smiled. Good afternoon, Ilishnish replied. Um, this is from the Adventurer Guild. She knew all of the vampire brides that worked for the post office, but none of them had names. They didn't seem to mind being nameless, however, and they always seemed to know when they were being addressed. The vampire bride reached into the crate and fished out a folder that was included within. After flipping through the contents, the vampire bride reached out and tapped a bell on the countertop. Before the clear sound dissipated, another vampire bride appeared from the back. She exchanged looks with the one at the counter before picking up the crate and looking pointedly at Hilishnish. This way, please, the vampire bride said. Somewhat puzzled, Ilishnish followed her into the office warehouse. Rather than stop anywhere inside, they ascended the flight of steps in the back to the top of the wall. The vampire bride stopped at the loading area of the newly renovated frost dragon pens and placed the infinite haversacks on a table. After reading through the folder, she looked up at Ilishnish. What's going on? Ilishnish asked. The note in here says that this delivery needs to go out right away. The vampire bride held up the folder and waved it beside her head. Please assume your natural appearance. Emmy? Why? The other flights on this shift are currently in the air, the vampire bride said. You're the only available flight in the city at the moment. But Lady Shiltier said that I've been removed from the delivery schedule. And that is precisely why you are available right now. Was that how it worked? It felt a bit of a stretch to her, then again. She had just failed the adventurer assessment, so she dared not add to the list of things that she might get into trouble over. She stretched her wings and tail after returning to her dragon self and, after being loaded with the infinite haversacks, the vampire bride rolled a map out over the table. Their delivery location is in the forest south of Fiorizo, she said, about 40 kilometers distant. Ilishnish lowered her head to study the map. Most of it seemed familiar. After putting the map away into her bag, Ilishnish stepped over to the edge of the wall and took wing. Have a safe journey, the vampire bride's voice drifted up after her. The currents of heated air that rose from the baked streets of the city lifted Ilishnish to a comfortable altitude in short order. Banking north, she scanned the scenery below until she spotted what she thought should be her destination. It was roughly 120 kilometers north of Irantal, if she was quick about it, she would be able to make it there in an hour or so. After weaving a pair of spell songs over herself, she set her course, cutting through the cool north wind as she hummed to herself. Idly watching the scenery go by below her, she crossed over the great forest of Tob and wondered why the adventurer expedition was taking so long.
She knew that humans weren't very mobile, but they couldn't be that slow, could they? It had been a bit over a week since the conclusion of the High Mountain training for the Adventurer Guild. Life had settled into a peaceful routine for Ilishnish while she waited for her adventurer debut. She attended the Justice Dragon Dojo twice a week, performed once a week at the Frosty Beard, and spent the remaining days wandering around the city, reading books, and sleeping. She thought it might be something like the life exploring the world that she had considered before she and her family had been forcefully relocated and turned into beasts of burden by the Sorceress Kingdom. No one in the city tried to eat her, actually, they were strangely nice. She quickly came to understand that, rather than a calculation between the material costs and benefits of associating with her, almost all interactions were entertained solely on the basis of her appearance. If one was powerful, they could get away with much. If one was physically attractive, they could also get away with much. If one was both powerful and attractive, well, Ilishnish could do almost anything she had wanted to, until recent months. With a bit of experimentation, she found that humans were quite simple to manipulate. Males, especially. Their gazes followed her, openly or otherwise, whenever she wasn't concealing her presence. They happily interacted with her, offering her favorable bargains, disclosing all manner of information, and making every effort to distinguish themselves and escalate their image in her measure. Humans didn't snivel and cringe like the Quagua and were by and large better learned. It was like having slaves that conveniently presented themselves wherever she went, and Ilishnish considered it a general improvement to her personal quality of life. The overarching tasks that Lady Shiltier had assigned to her were going slowly or quickly, depending on what they were. Her memory allowed her to perfectly absorb her physical observations wherever she went, but what any of it meant was more often than not up in the air. Customs, conversations, stories and behaviors, they meant nothing to her until she learned enough about their world. Fortunately, she could always learn that later and refer to the past to understand what had been going on at the time. Information and references that revolved around locations she had never frequented before were the worst, as she would have to go to the locations in person to best learn about them. Until then, it was long hours of reading and trying to make sense out of things with Hegemo, who stayed in his room during his breaks and performed research for her. On a more positive note, her stores of personal wealth were steadily building up. Between her weekly performances and odd jobs as she learned about life in Erantel, she had nearly half filled her infinite haversack with an assortment of texts, maps, platinum coins and a few small diamonds. Most of the weight was books, so she figured she could leave them with Hedgenmill to free up the magical container's limited capacity. She could also make some room by selling her eggs, since they were no longer needed, she would need to find out where she could gain the most for them. A commotion in the trees roughly ten kilometers ahead drew Elishnish from her ruminations, and she eyed the goings-on curiously. Frost giants at such a low altitude? I wonder what's happening. It was a small raiding party, or maybe a large scouting party? She supposed that there wasn't much of a difference between them. A horn blared far below. Oh, they're chasing someone down. Maybe I can pick up something valuable after it's all over, they don't have a sense for various things. Arriving above them, she banked into a wide circle, settling into a lazy glide as the scene unfolded below. The frost giants were split up into groups of two or three and occasionally stopped to take a swing at something small. Whoever it was wasn't faring very well, but that was to be expected of weak lowland peoples. They might be able to gang up on isolated giants, but probably had little chance against several at once. After a few moments, her humming stopped and she focused her attention on whatever the frost giants were attacking. It occurred to her that they might be who she was supposed to deliver her parcels to. She descended to a thousand meters over the treetops and recognized a few of them. Yep. It appeared that their camp was about a kilometer to the southeast, overlooking a boggy valley. Ilishnish dove towards the camp, determined to successfully complete her delivery before things got too busy there. She couldn't get into any more trouble than she might be in already, after all, 